Well, we have a full day, so sit back and relax. Before we get going, uh, I'd like to recognize a visitor in the back row that not long ago would have been standing up here uh, leading the way, and that's Lee Chesno. Um, <laughs> Lee was really, um, after he, his time at the National Weather Service, he gave his career to teaching, and teaching sailors, and safety was a big part of it. And there were lots of days when you'd hear about grib files and what they were and what they weren't from him, and the importance of the 500 millibar, and you're going to hear more of both subjects today. But Lee is really the progenitor of the whole thing, and we owe him a lot. Our community owes him a lot. There's a certain fascination to the weather, wonder to the weather. It um, is probably the most common conversation most of us have. Nice day today, eh? Look out there. You know right where you are. It's raining this afternoon. We're in Seattle, right? Um, and uh, has been for thousands of years, millennial. It affects our life in multiple ways, our work to greater or lesser extent. Uh, even the guys on Wall Street worry about the characteristics of weather. Um, 300 years before Christ, Aristotle wrote a treatise on meteorology and sort of set the stage for a lot of the work we're doing today, believe it or not. It's that old. It's been around. Um, it's been the subject of arts and artists. I see right away a conflict between the, uh, the Mac and the, uh, and the... This says analysis and forecasting. State of the art. Make no mistake, as I said last time, there remains a fair amount of art in this. And the importance of that is that you are an artist, whether you know it or not. You look out the door, you feel kind of sweaty, and you say, something's not quite right. The clammy air, this one, that one. That's part of the art of forecasting. And that art is hard to transmit, translate into digital format. The human element is still a very important part of weather forecasting. Keep that in mind as you go along and you look at product. There's a number of products we all pick up our phones and get our predict wind or one thing or another, and it's got to be right because it's in color. Looks lovely, right? <laughs> and you realize, wait a minute, it's just a computer output, no human intervention. Remember what he said? It's got a, still a fair amount of art involved in the whole thing. Um, myth and mythology for hundreds of years. North wind doth blow, we shall have snow. Right? Red sky in the morning, on we go, on and on. Right? Um, myth and mythology uh, really was central to the whole of the effort through pretty much the 1500s. The scientific method was just coming along. Systematic acquisition, systematic acquisition of information. And the quantitative framework, the calculus and the rest, Leibniz and Newton, to be able to solve the equations that govern. But that didn't stop artists from playing in the 1800s. Of course, we have our friend, Mr. Whitman, and the uh, Leaves of Grass fame. But he went out one day and wrote up this little poem. It's quite long. I just took a couple of snippets out of it. And he went, I ascended the towering rocks along the Pacific. I guess that's why I picked it, because I'm an East Coast guy, and I'm in the Pacific now. I sailed out to sea through the storm. It will, I was refreshed by the storm, and so forth. Marked the white combs where they careered so high, curling over. And he goes on, noted the slender and jagged threads of lightning, air, sea, um, as the scientist reads it, right? Uh, as sudden and fast amid the din, they chased each other across the sky. These and such as these I elate, saw, saw with wonder. There it is. Yet pensive and masterful, all the menacing might of the globe arisen around me. You know, you can just sort of, particularly those of you that have been offshore a little bit, you can just sort of get the sense of it all. A fair number of poets, uh, mid-1800s, Whitman, an interesting 
poet laureate of the US. Um, sorry. John Constable, uh, famous for his paintings of clouds. He really brought clouds along in the times, mid 1800s. And he saw the clouds uh, as landscapes. As you lay on the grass looking at the clouds, you might see a dog or a rock or a beach or a, you know, as your whimsy takes you as you go. For uh, uh, Constable, it was the landscape. And he brought them into landscape uh, uh, paintings and drawings. Um, it was his effort, his artistic effort, was more or less consistent, coincident, with the development of the scientific methods. The 1800s really saw an increase in our understanding of meteorology, the factors that govern atmospheric circulation. And I've got some hiding on the other side. Um, we had ourselves some cloud classifications for the first time, high, middle level, and upper level clouds and cloud cover. So you began to take, in your diaries, you began to make reasonably uh, repeatable, quantitative, qualitative uh, uh, loggings of conditions. Um, this was all, this is the early 1800s. And through the 1800s, that led to the development of diaries, sailing directions, you know, not the Fontaine Maury in this country, um, and ultimately to one of my heroes. Everybody knows Fitzroy, of course, in the room. Uh, he was, he sailed with that fellow Darwin. Some people call him Darwin's captain, but it was really, uh, Darwin was the cabin boy for the captain here. Uh, Fitzroy, very interesting fellow, and take a read. As it says here, 1854, he's appointed meteorological status to the British board, okay? So he was doing in England very much the same work that Maury was doing over here. And from it, and a few incidents, ships lost and the like, um, he began, of course, my, you know, experienced offshore navigator, responsible for the most part for all the mappings of the Patagonia region in uh, some very, very difficult conditions, what Beagle did down there. Fitzroy, in fact, took command after the previous captain had committed suicide for the conditions down there. Um, and um, he believed in the value of the barometer. Fitzroy, there is a Fitzroy barometer right now. You can still get them in some of the antique shops. I'm sure David could probably put you a line on that. But he believed that if you took a look at the barometer, the way it was behaving, you could anticipate weather change. Now you put those observations together with the increase in communications, and he began to believe in the value of gathering together a number of station observations and using it to develop some estimates of what's going to be going on tomorrow, knee the weather forecast. He's credited with the term Fitzroy. And the first weather forecast came out in 1861. And here you see a series of stations okay, that he's getting information from. And then down here, general weather probable during the next two days. In the north, moderate westerly winds, fine, and so forth. He reads on down to the south, fresh westerly, still fine. And he initiated a series of storm warnings, the flags that we used to, we grew up with, right? Um, all came from around this time. But for the most part, still observational and a lot of qualitative. When we move to 1900, things really started to change. The Norwegian school uh, are prominent in oceanography and prominent equally in meteorology. And Birknes and his son really initiated the quantitative method that's used to this day, for the most part, to describe atmospheric circulation. They solved a very simple series of equations. And I'm sure you all remember conservation equations. And the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, you'll see when we get into discussions of things like Coriolis, the fact that we're moving all over the surface of a rotating Earth, conservation of angular momentum, the conservation equations were key to the solution, along with thermal energy and continuity. You got a mass of water, you got to squeeze it through a hole. Conserve mass, sort of a thing. 
very simple concepts. Now 1900 didn't have the computers, didn't really start seeing analytical solutions to the equations until about 1926, Richardson initiated that. And it took him by hand about three or four days to a week to solve a 24-hour equation. So you figure the time scale on it. Of course, the first time we ran a, um, a solution on the computer, ENIAC in the uh, uh, early 1950s, I guess, or so, uh, it took a day for a 24-hour forecast on the computer. So I think, think we, where we've come along. Now, the point of all this babble as we go along through this is time scale. We have with so many things, like a, we've always had an iPhone. That's my grandson's view, right? They've always had an iPhone. Actually, it's, it's only a little over 10 years or so that you've had an iPhone. And you say, uh, the same thing goes when you take a look at weather forecasts. Why don't they do better, 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 better? In, in fact, an awful lot of what you're looking at is fairly young. And we're still very much in the development stage. And there's improvements. We were talking around dinner table last night about improvements that are going on all the time. So keep in mind the time scales. Okay? Birkney sought to predict the dynamical and physical condition of the atmosphere at a later time if at an earlier time this condition is well known. Initial conditions, key. How we start the game off. Definition of initial conditions. In 1962, Joanne Starr Malchus, now working with the early days of the computers and the rest of it, staring at meteorological questions. She's a well-known meteorologist, says, Except for man himself, the weather is probably the most variable, unreliable, fluctuatory phenomenon known to man. You know, that he's tried to stop and say. That sounds very optimistic, wouldn't you say, as you, come, as you come at it? Should you be surprised that you sometimes have difficulty? Why? Important. This will be on the quiz. Why? The challenges that the flows we're dealing with are fundamentally turbulent, to some extent chaotic, but they're turbulent. Okay? Now you want to you put that in your head and you can go back out and you can Google up turbulent and see what the meaning is and the full meaning of the word. But fundamentally turbulent. And all we have to do is look around us. You walk by a creek, you see the flows past the rock, beautiful wake in the, in the tail of the rock, lots of interactive flow going on. You look at the cloud cover, lay in the bed yesterday morning, the day before, it was blowing about 40 as the front went past us in, uh, in Mystic, and the clouds were just spectacular going by. This is the blue marble you're going to see again and again. You take a look at this guy. This, uh, if you took a look at that running as a loop, it, you could convince yourself you're looking at a moderately turbulent regime going through it. And you're all moderately familiar with, sorry, with this guy. Um, if we had a cigar, the old days, we could stand here and demonstrate it to you. But this is now a jet coming out of a nozzle. And the flow along the left hand there is pretty much straight and parallel. The streamlines are parallel to each other. There isn't much crossing of the streamlines. But that's the flow region is called laminar. The flow proceeds in a series of layers. And the laminar region in fluid dynamics is generally an orderly and easily described region, a deterministic region. Two and two is four, deterministic. Okay? Once we get off that, though, and in geophysical flows, natural flows, you get out of that region pretty quickly. You watch the smoke proceeding off a smokestack. A lot of buoyancy right next to the stack, and then as it starts to drift off downwind, it gets progressively more turbulent more erratic and irregular. Okay? Down in here is the challenge. And that's generally the region we work in, you play in, and you work in. The flow is turbulent. And it's a system that proceeds over the vertical a fair way. This is an important slide to keep in your head as you go from the surface, surface pressure, mean pressure, something like 10, 13 millibars. And as you're proceeding up, Okay, you get up to around, this is eight, 500 millibars, about 18,000 18, feet, and then 250 millibars, somewhere around 30, 35,000 feet or so. The temperature on the average decreases. But we've got, this is our weather down in here. Okay, proceeds over the vertical and the horizontal. 
Uh, important to remember, the game we're playing with, the weather, is a result of this fundamental. There is, this is incoming solar radiation, which is our primary source of heat surface of the Earth. There's some slight amount from the interior, but it's negligible generally. And we have an excess of incoming solar radiation in the equatorial regions. So you're warming up your aquarium down at the equator. And that warming uh, begins to develop a circulation, good thing, because there's a deficit at the poles. Okay, more heat is going out at the pole than coming in. More heat coming in at the equator, more heat going out at the pole. That's a good thing that we have this overturning from the equator to the pole. Otherwise, the equator would be getting hotter and hotter, and the poles would be getting colder and colder. And we generally like to live in a fairly narrow thermal range. So there's your uh, the, the system that's driving. You've got this equatorial polar imbalance in heat, and you've got it proceeding to move heat from the equator to the pole and a, and a flow that is generally turbulent. That's all you have to do is describe it. And as that air moves, it gives you some winds that we play with. Okay? The other thing to remember, you saw before, Birkney's is talking about initial conditions. Ed Lawrence was a meteorologist at MIT. He was playing one day with a computer and some modeling. Um, and to make the long story short, in the course of the work over the day, what he found is that a very small difference in the initial condition will make a very large difference in the result of the model run. It was an, it was an accident. He went out to get a cup of coffee. Okay, honest to God, it's like so many discoveries, it was an accident. But he discovered the importance of the initial conditions. And from it, you may have heard the term the butterfly effect. So Eddy from the butterfly's wings, as he's making his way from Mexico to, uh, to Mystic, Connecticut, okay, that slight eddy, eddying, may induce a flow that ends up being major weather event. Okay? The definition of the initial condition is a very important part of the game. You're going to hear about that as we proceed as well. Okay? The combination of all of this, we're dealing with turbulent flow, is that in general the weather forecast that we're playing with, although they say it might rain at 2 o'clock this afternoon, and you take it that way, they really are saying it may rain this afternoon at 2 o'clock. And there's a more or less probability of it. And in some cases, if it's 2 o'clock this afternoon, we'd like to believe it's 100 percent. That's honest to God, going to get it rain. But if you get out to 15, 16 days, as you do in some of these guys, uh, the probabilities uh, get a little bit fuzzier as we go. The question is how far you might go and have a reliable forecast. You're going to be asking that today as you go along, as you proceed through this. Um, the uh, National Weather Service, for this and other GFS model, uh, provides some estimates of probability. You probably never even looked at it, but it's under model guidance in the, uh, in the OPC output. And you can get an idea for 20 knot winds. This is for 20 knot winds. The zero hour probability of, at 10 meters, you're going to get 20 knot winds. It's in the red zones. Okay? And we can carry that out to 16 days, if you believe it. Remembering what he said about the probability it gets, it gets less and less as you go further and further out. And if you don't believe that, um, Joe Sinkowitz might talk to you about, this is an old slide showing you that if we take a look at the European center model, this is the European model you've heard about before, and um, the, the probability that they're going to be getting something like 60% agreement, which of course I call 50-50, but that's another story. Um, it runs, it, it's been going out, this went to 2013. They believe they can get out to something like eight, um, eight and a half days or so in fairly reliable modeling. Um, you might care to question that. Okay? You might get the idea that what we're doing here is really not providing you with any answers, but providing you with lots of questions. And that's what I hope you'll come with today. You look at some of this, say, okay, because all of this started uh, for us 
in 2016, at the start of the Bermuda race, there was a forecast for uh, Alan Gamora. It was a, a fa 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 fairly serious condition, and a fair number of boats dropped out. And after it, a fair number of people started asking, why the difference? Why the conditions were not that bad? In fact, I had to tell our crew when we were going through the Gulf Stream. Uh, it's a nice afternoon sail. We're going down through the Gulf Stream. We're supposed to be about 30 knots wind against the stream. Um, Say, so why the forecast error? Well, what is the forecast? What's the nature of the forecast? Uh, how much confidence should we put in a forecast for how long? On that page that you had for the uh, program, this is the nature of the problem. The character of your dance partner, what you're looking at today. Okay, what is weather? Current state of the atmosphere. Whether it's fundamentally the result of collisions of air masses in that circulatory system, equator to the pole. Okay? It's dynamic, displays significant spatial and temporal variability. And you guys live it here. Pacific Northwest is the poster child for some of that. Okay? You're downwind from some relatively unadulterated, interesting situations. Okay? Okay. Okay. Write that down, right? <laughs> Write that down. Um, it, uh, it says it's it, due to variations in latitude, surface character, roughness, atmospheric water content, incoming solar radiation, and the resulting flows are turbulent, meaning that they are to some extent chaotic and best described by statistical methods. Uh, yet most of us take these to be deterministic. So what you ought to be looking at today when the, when the pros get up and you, know, you can question it, is the forecast of future weather depend on an understanding of atmospheric physics, a combination of observational data, very often at sea, those data are nowhere near as dense as they are over land. So it should come as no surprise that sometimes the marine forecasts are not as good as the terrestrial ones as we go through this. Um, analyst interpretations, I said that at the outset, how important the analyst is. When you look at an Ocean Prediction Center forecast, it generally has a name on it. So you can go to Sinkowitz, pick up the phone and call him up and ask him what he was thinking about when he put this thing out. There really is a face to the forecast down there. But a lot of forecasts we get, that isn't true. Okay? And the, the accuracy, accuracy is depending on adequacy of all of these components, not just one. Okay, with that, we're going to go over now. Uh, Ken McKinley is going to get us into, um, what do we want to call it? Meteorology 101, I said last time, or one, the beginning. I hope you had a chance to look. I understand that the audio has gone a little bit bad on that, uh, that loop, but I hope you had a chance to look at some of Ken's stuff before. So we're going to uh, go through 101. Then I'm going to get into some of the oceanographic components. Um, Joe Sinkowitz is going to do some marine forecasting here. Uh, we'll take a break for lunch. Then uh, Kirby Cook is going to be talking to us about coastal weather. Um, Dave Birch, evaluation of the marine forecast. Uh, Jeff Tomasin is going to be here from Oceans this afternoon. And uh, finish out with a wrap from Ken, Mr. Honey. Um, there'll be no breaks this morning. Uh, there is coffee in the back. There'll be a break this evening, this afternoon. Um, there, are, you all, there are heads one floor down and one floor up. They are? Yeah. Okay, thank you. We were told they weren't was up. So much for that information. <laughs> they, they may be up, they may be up too. Oh, gotcha. Up is okay. This floor is an added. Thank you. Ken? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.